Welcome back, Rob Bryanton, the Imagining the Tenth Dimension video blog. Uh, this is the July 7th, 2008 entry, and today we're talking about a line lander. Now, uh, you'll know that we've talked a lot about flat landers, the idea of two-dimensional creatures. Uh, Edwin Abbott's book also talked about space landers, which are people like us who uh, live in a three-dimensional space, and he also talked about line landers. Uh, creatures that live in a one-dimensional space. So uh, if you're thinking of uh, what we're looking at now as uh, points on a line, each of these uh, heads that are in this line would be uh, one of the possible positions that you could occupy in a one-dimensional line. So it's it's not really a very accurate representation of a line lander, but it's something uh, kind of fun to look at visually. So that's what we're playing with today. If you want to read along, please go to 10thdimension.com slash blog, and the July 7th uh, entry is what we're looking at today. Now we're going to start uh, from reading, uh, or start this entry reading from Wikipedia, uh, the article on dimensions. And I'm quoting here, it says in that article, in mathematics, no definition of dimension adequately captures the concept in all situations where we'd like to make use of it. Consequently, mathematicians have devised numerous definitions of dimension for different types of spaces. All, however, are ultimately based on the concept of the dimension of Euclidean n space, E superscript n. The point E0 is zero dimensional. The point, or the line E1 is one dimensional. The plane E2 is two-dimensional. In general, E to the N is N-dimensional. Again, that's from Wikipedia, the article on dimensions. Because there are so many different ways to define the word dimensions, some people with their own narrow definition of the word have claimed that my use of the word is not correct. The, de the definition that we've just read then from Wikipedia works very well for the way of imagining the dimensions that we've been playing with here. Each additional dimension adds an additional degree of freedom that was unavailable from the previous one. If the ten dimensions that physicists are talking about are truly spatial dimensions, or as some prefer to say, space-like dimensions, then a seven-dimensional space must have seven coordinates that would define the position of a unique point within that seven-dimensional system and so on. So the space E7 is seven-dimensional, and that is the kind of dimensions we're talking about in imagining the tenth dimension. When the website for this project first went live two years ago, a number of people had questions about the animation, since parts of it didn't just parrot what the mainstream had been saying about how our reality is constructed. Two years later, I'm pleased that a number of new theories have come forward from respected physicists which can be easily connected to the supposedly out there ideas that were in this original video and its accompanying book. There's still many more ideas attached to this project that will eventually be proved or disproved in the months and years to come. One of the most important basic assumptions about this project is that if physicists are really saying that these ten dimensions are spatial, then we should be able to use what we know about the first three or four dimensions to do, to do some things about the additional degrees of freedom that these extra spatial dimensions would add. Saying, you can't imagine the fifth dimension and above because they're totally unlike the dimensions of space-time is, I think, taking the easy way out. Are we saying these additional dimensions are spatial or not? Of course it becomes harder and harder to imagine each additional dimension beyond the space-time we're familiar with, but that, that doesn't mean it's impossible. Uh, now here's a brief side note. You may have noticed that the term extra dimensions is often used rather than higher dimensions when talking about the dimensions beyond space-time. I think this is a useful distinction because saying higher somehow sets the idea up in our minds that we should be gazing skyward as we think about these additional dimensions. A more valid way of thinking about each new dimension is that it is somehow outside the current dimension, and that there's no way for us to get to the states that are within that additional dimension if we stay within the current one. For instance, with three-dimensional space, we need to add the fourth dimension or there's no way to get from 3D space in one state to 3D space in another state. The directions of time and anti-time are the two new directions that we're able to reach by adding the fourth dimension into the equation. Saying that each new dimension is at right angles to the one below is another way of thinking about that same idea. 
Last blog, we talked about the viewpoint of a flatlander, an imaginary two-dimensional creature. Now let's try this as a thought experiment. Imagine yourself on a one-dimensional line. If that were your world, anything other than forward on the line and backward on the line would be unfathomable. Imagining some kind of a wormhole that folded your line to allow instantaneous jumping from one position to another might possibly be something you could wrap your head around, and that would give you a way to imagine the second dimension. But dimensions beyond that would be so completely outside your experience that you would probably be inclined to say that the extra dimensions beyond the second dimension were theoretical construct constructs only, with no way for a one-dimensional people to be able to imagine such an outlandish geometry. For a one-dimensional linelander, a second dimension at right angles to the dimension he lived in would possibly be imaginable, but something that was at an additional right angle that was somehow different from the first right angle already considered to create a three-dimensional space might well seem beyond the ability for our poor linelander to imagine. The diffic difficulty is particularly compounded for the linelander since he can easily imagine only one way of extending out to an additional dimension. So visualizing each additional dimension would require him to imagine a repetitive right angles operation over and over again. The advantage we have over a line lander is that we are intimately familiar with a space of three dimensions. So for us, to imagine three unique right angles that together to, could help to form a cube is much easier. And this is why using the line branch fold works so well for us as a visual, visualization tool, because it gives us an ordered way of imagining how three different dimensions are at right angles to each other. So here we are, imagining ourselves as a line lander on a one-dimensional line, trying to imagine how our 1D world might be able to bend or fold to allow instantaneous teleportation to other points on our line. Einstein suggested that we should think of gravity as a bending of space-time. Whether we're talking about folding, branching, twisting, bending, or any other spatial manipulation word you care to think of, all of these are ways to start thinking about the next dimension up. The dimension that is moving at right angles to the one currently being examined. To be clear then, the point, line, branch, fold concepts that this project starts from are really just interchangeable spatial manipulation terms that repeatedly find different ways to describe the same idea of moving to the next dimension, which is why this concept can work no matter where you start. A second dimensional plane can be thought of as a thick line joining two other lines, or it can be thought of as a branch off of a line, or it can be thought of as being created by the folding of a line. These are all ways of thinking how the one dimension we are looking at is at right angles to the other. Like our line lander, right angles are relatively easy for us to imagine for the dimensions we live in, which in our case as 3D space landers would be the first three or four dimensions. But for us, saying that the sixth dimension is at right angles to the fifth dimension doesn't create a particularly useful mental image. This is why the line branch fold metaphor is so powerful. It lets us visualize something that is easier to hold in our minds than if we were to just imagine the line, 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 or branch, 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 or fold, 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 that uh, we'd have to be imagining. So, each of these terms is a different way of thinking about that same, this is how a dimension is at right angles to the one below concept. This is also why I say time is in the next dimension up, no matter what dimension you're examining, because time is another way of moving at right angles to the dimensions below. And this is why time, for a flatlander, a 2D flatlander, would be a, in the direct, or would be a direction in the third dimension. Now, there's a blog entry that uh, has just been recently be, been posted at uh, YouTube. It's called Wormholes. I'd like you to search for that one, because it ex extends a discussion that's in the tenth dimension FAC as well, which you can find if you just search for tenth dimension FAC FAQ in uh, Google. It'll come up there, and the question uh, in the FAC is can you really fold a dimension? And my answer is yes, you can fold a dimension and science calls that a wormhole. But with the logic of what we're examining here, different wormholes would have different effects depending upon the dimension being folded. And ultimately, this give us, gives us ways of thinking how the solid reality we are seeing at this very instant could be nothing more than shadows of higher dimensional shapes and patterns. Connecting our reality together 
in ways that are beyond our ability to direct, directly witness from down here in space-time. We're going to finish off today's video blog entry with uh, one of the 26 songs from this project. This is uh, the very first song uh, in the set of 26 because it ties together so many of the ideas we've been talking about here. And the song is called Everything Fits Together. From Rob Bryanton, enjoy the journey. It's the age-old question You'll know everything.